joining us for today's lunchtime webinar uh, from land to sea why biodiversity is so important. So my name is Fiona McMillan, I'm Alumni and Business Engagement Officer here at the University of Stirling um, and I'll be doing my very best to keep us to time today but I'm quite interested by some of the panellists conversations so you know you might be here all day don't blame me for that one. I am joined by the wonderful Jen Foreman who is our University Alumni Manager I suspect a, a number of you will know, you know her already, and for those of you who don't, you're in for a treat as you get to know Jen. And I'm also joined by Alex McKenna, our fundraising manager. Uh, so we'll be managing the chat throughout today. So if you've got any questions or comments, please do send them in either in the chat box or in the Q&A function. Um, and at the end of today's session, we'll have a little bit of time for some, some Q&A. Um, if we don't get time to cover everything today, and I don't think we will, uh, we'll try and get some answers back from our panel for you as well. So this is the second event in our new alumni webinar series. We recently did one on sports and esports, uh, which was really enjoyable and will be on our alumni YouTube. And now we're looking at one around biodiversity. We couldn't really let COP26 go by and not use this opportunity to showcase the work that our alumni are doing in this field. So before we move on and just introduce our panel, um, the purpose of today is really about sharing information and celebrating uh, our alumni's achievements in this area. We wish that we had a magic wand to fix all the problems that we're facing, but what we don't have, that we don't have that, but what we do have is a way to try and talk about the changes that we can make and hopefully look at some positive approaches that are being made by our alumni in the field. So it's a real pleasure to be able to shine a light on the work that our panelists are involved in, what they're doing now and what they'll be taking forward long after COP26 has been and gone. So it's a real pleasure to introduce our panelists. What a lineup we have for you today. So kicking us off is Connor McKinney, who's a 2007 environmental science graduate of Sterling. Uh, Connor is an ecological consultant with a wealth of field experience, including a recent um, conservation mission to St Kilda. I'm very much looking forward to him talking about that. So I can't wait for that bit. Um, you might have seen or heard Connor recently on BBC Home Grounds, and he's also been on Radio 4 earlier this week. So we're really looking forward to finding out a bit more about his work. Following Connor is Karis Mainbrides, who is a 2017 graduate uh, of marine biology. So Karis works for the Christ and Carbon Centre, uh, which is an independent non-profit focused on education, educating towards a low carbon society, uh, working largely in peatlands. Her experience and passion for the third sector and for education is clear in her CV, and I'm really looking forward to you all getting a chance to hear a bit about Karis's work. Um, and rounding us off today, we have Holly Palin, who is joining us at a very early start from her home in Canada. So Holly was a visiting student to Sterling back in 1998 and has very fond memories of her time on campus. It's a real pleasure to, to bring her back and connect her with Sterling for today's webinar. Holly works as the Director of Innovation and Youth Engagement um, at the Department of Environment and Climate Change within the Canadian government um, and is, has a number of previous roles in the forest industry. Really interested to see uh, how Canada and Scotland have dif uh, differences and similarities in the way that we're approaching these global challenges. So that's more than enough from me. So grab us something in a cup, sit back and enjoy today's session. Connor, I'll start with you. Yeah, no problem. I'll uh, just grab the screen here. So can we all see that? Okay, folks, um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, my adventures as such in St Kilda. Uh, St Kilda isn't a place that needs any real introduction. Um, it's one of the most widely written about um, archipelagos, and uh, it's, it's kind of clear to see why once you're out there. The place is absolutely chock-a-block with natural heritage um, and history. Um, you, wherever you walk on the island, you can almost feel the shades of the past over your shoulder. But it's an area that, despite its, its, its biodiversity, um, still is vulnerable, um, uh, namely from issues like overfishing and climate change. Um, so it's quite, I guess it's, it's quite apt that we're talking about the place today, um, because although it's re remote, although it's isolated, um, there are issues uh, that it is facing, um, which you wouldn't think that the hand of humanity could reach so far, um, but it certainly does. So, um, quick introduction to, uh, to St Kilda. Um, it's a special area of conservation. Um, it's a special uh, protection area. And it's also a site of special scientific interest. 
It's, it's a land of superlatives. Um, it's the most remote, it's the most isolated, it's got the highest cliffs in Europe. And as a result, it has a significant amount of these types of uh, designations. Um, it's also a marine protected area. It's a marine protected area for a lot of the marine mammals that are in and around uh, the archipelago. It's a special protection area for the birds, special area conservation for the reefs and the sea cave habitats that it has. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, not just for natural heritage, but also for its cultural heritage. It's also a scheduled monument area, and I've put those wee, that, that wee ellipse down there because basically the, the list of designations continues. It's a national scenic area, it's a national nature reserve. I mean, it's, it's probably one of the most um, uh, protected sites in the world. Indeed, it's one of only 39 sites that has a dual UNESCO World Heritage status. So we're talking about a place of almost unequivocal importance here um, in terms of uh, its designations anyway. So what in God's green earth took me out to St Kilda? Um, effectively, I was working on biosecurity. I, do, I was undertaking a project on invasive non-native species um, and I was approached to come out and give a hand uh, basically on a construction project. St Kilda as well, it's its value to wildlife and to cultural heritage. It's also a site that is incredibly important for national security. Um, on top of the hill, there's a couple of uh, military installations. And basically the project that I was working on was uh, helping to upgrade those installations. And also it was to turn what was quite an eyesore, ugly military camp um, you can see the old green shelters here. Um, this is the old accommodation block just along here. And you can see this is the red square they call, and this is the old energy center, which made a, used to make a heck of a noise. And um, it was to try and reduce the footprint of the, um, of the infrastructure that was on the island. So effectively we turned something like this into something like that. The red square is still there, um, but you can see the new building here. This is the new accommodation center and you can see the new, um, you can just about make out the roof of the new energy center as well. Now the whole project was designed, these buildings, as I'm sure you can see, are designed around the cleats that you can see in the foreground here. You know, they have the green roof, they have the slanting to try and sort of ease the impact of the uh, infrastructure on the island. So um, that was, the, uh, that was the, the, the thinking behind it. Um, and we reduced, as you can see, all of this concrete that's out here, that, that was basically dug up and taken off site. So um, while the military is still there and the, a lot of the guys that are working at the stations are, are still living there as such sort of on a month off, month on basis, it has lessened uh, considerably the uh, impact, um, the visual impact certainly of the, uh, of the, of the, of the footprint there. Now, um, one of the big issues and why, why they got in touch with myself about the biosecurity was because that St Kilda is one of the islands that, that was recommended for prioritization with regards to brown rat biosecurity measures. And it's not just the rats, I guess. We, we focus a lot on the rats during the project, but it's also things like hedgehogs, for instance, that whilst native to Great Britain and, and potentially Ireland, for example, they're not native to every single part. So don't mistake the biogeographical -ge boundaries or the political boundaries. St Kilda hedgehogs aren't native to St Kilda, mink aren't native, otters aren't native. You know, th this is an island where these species have never established. Um, rats are the, exactly the same thing. If, if these species were to get onto Herta and Dunn, um, then effectively what we would see is seabird predation, uh, egg predation. <clears throat> so it would begin to undermine the integrity of the, of the ecosystem out there. Now at the bottom right, um, you can just about make out my, wee, my, my that's myself there in the wee yellow jacket. Um, so basically what, what used to happen was because of its difficulty um, in actually getting out to the site, we used to use an old Norwegian military landing craft to, um, to take on the equipment and uh, to take on the, the plant that we were going to need to do the construction. Now, that carries with it a significant amount of risk, which we're going to talk about. So um, the risk that it has is that um, obviously the, uh, the boat that lands from Loch Carna, uh, which is just in the Outer Hebrides, um, it sets sail and it comes to Herta, where ourselves. Now, while it's in Loch Carna, it's lying up against a pier, which means that it's more than, um, it, well, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a chance 
that it could be invaded by mink, by rats, and which are all uh, located in and around the Loch Carnan area. Now, uh, the biosecurity measures that we implemented were threefold. Um, we undertook uh, trapping and poisoning work in and around the, the harbour itself. And um, I had to get an excuse to use this wee picture. This is, this is actually a, a picture that I took of a uh, scene killed a mouse on the island, but generally what you tended to find was a lot of the mice, the mice got trap happy because they knew they were going to get let out. They were, the traps were checked twice a day because they knew they were going to get let out. Um, then they used to sit and watch and wait for you. Um, so this is one of the mice uh, that used to sort of sit in a trap and just watch and wait um, for me to come around. You can actually see him looking out at me as if to say, here, pal, you're, you're about an hour late. But anyway, um, there are traps much like that, um, mostly for the rats. Um, those traps that would be used would be uh, either poisoned or there would be bait and then the animal would be effectively killed, uh, dispatched if, if it was found there. Now that's all to ensure that the pier remains um, free of any potential hitchhikers. Then when it gets to the Morrison, we had similar processes and procedures on there. So you can see this is a flatbed truck that's coming across in the Morrison. This is the deck here. And you can see just uh, at the picture at the top right, you can see that there's uh, traps, including snap traps and cage traps that are there um, to stop any mice or um, mink um, that would be coming across. So there's different baits being used there. Sometimes they got Nutella, sometimes they got peanut butter. Um, other times they got, uh, you know, flavored, back, uh, flavored wax blocks. And um, the mink, we used to bait with um, uh, cotton wool, like sheep's wool, even um, soaked in like a fish oil, um, which helped to attract uh, mink in. So we had these measures on board the Morrison as well. And then I guess the final of the, the triple locks sort of process that we had was myself on the island in Herta. And um, so we had the trap checks throughout the bay. There were 13 traps that we had in and around the bay that, we, that were baited continuously. We used to keep the watch and brief then during the landing. And then we also had camera trapping at the freshwater sites. And the idea of the freshwater site camera trapping was, A, you know, if rats come onto the island, they need a source of fresh water to drink. And um, so if we had a fire pond, that would be the first source of fresh water that it would get. Um, and secondly, well, to be honest, um, we always used to get really weird birds coming, coming along there. So it was, uh, it was twofold. It helped actually uh, keep the records of a lot of the migrating birds that we would get. So it wasn't just biosecurity. It played like an environmental, a general environmental protection rule as well and um, responded to it's a construction site. Um, there was leaks, there was, you know, accidents, there was uh, spills and various different other things. And I have to say, I mean, the boys were really, really good, but um, there were th times where things went wrong. So, for example, you might develop a leak in underneath the engine or hydraulic fuel, for example, one of the pumps might go. So effectively, um, a big part of my role was um, that emergency response um, to any potential spills and leaks um, to make sure that the island was protected. And we had inherent measures built in, such as no storage of plant and equipment um, anywhere near the water, um, only on concrete where it was there. And we had other things like, um, you know, uh, we had oil spill kits and, and granules and various different, we had like a microbial agent. So everything was sort of kept on top. So that was a big part of my role. Well, it, it was it was an important part of my role, but it wasn't a big part of my role. I didn't actually spend that much time doing it. Uh, a big part was actually a uh, risk assessing for breeding birds. When you come on to St Kilda, there's stones and rocks. It's craggy, it's rocky. There's um, walls that are about two and a half feet thick by six feet high. And these are brilliant places for nesting birds, particularly the likes of the foamer. They used to nest everywhere on the island. So they were a big part of the risk assessments that we've done, making sure that the island was, that those birds um, where they were breeding were protected because they used to just sit there and watch you, you know, and they were quite, it wasn't that they were naive to the danger, but, you know, once they're on eggs, the way Fulmer will uh, respond is just by vomiting on you. Um, they cough up or they vomit up like a, like a really smelly oil, which is where the name comes from, Fulmar, which is um, foil gull in Norse, um, because of the smell, that self-defense that they push out. But as a result of that, they were also sort of um, vulnerable to, for example, moving plant and pedestrians and all that sort of stuff. So it was about making sure we knew exactly where the birds were nesting so that we could build that into our plans and make sure that we stayed, we gave those places a wide berth. Um, and as I say, building in that sort of avoidance and mitigation. And then there's wee jobs like puffin patrols, which, which was nice, but it, it got tiresome. And uh, I've still got scars yet um, from where the wee buggers bit me. And um, that whole role was basically because, because there's a camp, you have lights and puffins, manx water, petrels are all the same in that whenever they fledge from the nests, 
They can confuse light pollution with uh, the stars that they use to navigate with. So very often we used to find these birds in and around the camp. Um, and it was my job, uh, along with the National Trust for Scotland guys, to make sure that those birds were protected um, in and around by the site activities. So there was a lot of things like, you know, underneath the accommodation, there used to be gaps where the birds would go because their cavity nesters is perfect for them. And it was about putting wire up to make sure, for example, those birds didn't get caught. The problem with the birds is that um, if they're caught, if they're grounded, they aren't able to fly off. And if they aren't able to fly off, then never mind the plant um, and the pedestrians and the risk associated with those. Um, there's also the risk associated with the great skua. Um, and there was over 50, 60 great skua across the island. You know, they're large goals as such, but uh, they're better off thought about as a, as a raptor, almost the um, the issue or the impacts that they have on, on their ecosystem. You know, they'll chase and harry other birds, ground them and then predate them. So they will. So something like a puffin or manx shearwater, once grounded, it's very vulnerable to that sort of predation. So a big part of my role was these guys, because we were doing a lot of trapping, there was obviously a lot of bycatch of the St. Kilda mouse. And they are they are an adorable wee animal. Um, they, they're, they're smart. Um, they have personalities. Um, this is another guy that um, I had names for them all. I'm not even going to embarrass myself by telling you what they were. But um, this guy I used to get, again, he was one of the trap happy ones. You know, used to see him almost sitting like a, like a philosophical hermit um, out in St. Kilda, watching the sunrise in the morning from his, on top of the wee uh, wax blocks. And this is a picture from when I uh, was undertaking a translocation work. So part of my work, obviously, St. Kilda mice are considered an endemic, speech, uh, an endemic species to St. Kilda. They were taken over about uh, 2,000 years ago. And since then, they've gone through a period of divergence. They've evolved in a very different way from the mice that we have back in the mainland. And they've got bigger. Um, they've gone through this process of giganticism because they've been released from predation. So um, they are a feature of interest, but this particular, you know, you know, a big part of my role was making sure that the work we were undertaking wasn't harming the St. Kilda mice and the St. Kilda wren and St. Kilda dandelion, those endemic species. <clears throat> and you can see these are the wee boxes. One of the very first things we done was we created these um, little translocation boxes, which the mice used. Um, I was more surprised than anybody. We, we based them on, uh, on, on a harvest dormouse sort of look because it sort of helped give the mice dry feet. Um, which is going to be important there because there's quite a lot of rain and, and wind, et cetera, during the winter. So yeah, we found the um the, the mice were using them. Um we had Sue sheep wool. Um this is the this is a sheep that's native, well not native to St. Kilda, but it's it's found there. It's 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 a close ancestor to the mouflon, um, which is the overriding ancestor of all sheep. So they they tend to leave wool lying around them. So we grabbed some of that, put it inside the boxes, and sure enough, the boxes were all being used once we moved the mice from where the demolition was happening. And it was good to see. Now, the only problem is that um, other mice have gone through something similar. And a piece of research by a guy called Anthony Bicknell um, demonstrated that actually the St. Kilda mice were beginning to, or are um, more, some, some, some meta populations of the St. Kilda mice in particular in and around the seabird nesting colonies to the west of the island up by Mullet Bay, have a significant amount of marine isotopes within their blood system, which shows that they're actually beginning to eat a lot of seabirds. Now, what we don't know is whether or not it is predation or scavenging. And that, that, that potentially has a, it's a potentially a very important bit of work because if it is found like other islands, um, like Gough Island and, and like Marion Island here, which, where you can see mice have also gone a similar process of giganticism. And that process of getting bigger um, has basically meant that they can take advantage of, uh, of, of, of foods, of, of food that they, they, they naturally may not have been able to. So for example, birds, um, become uh, because of their bigger size, they're able to potentially predate some of these um, seabirds. Now it's it's a bit concerning this report that came out from um, from from Tony, and it's something that uh, needs to be kept a, a watch and brief on because if it is found that some killed the mice are potentially predating on leeches petrels, and um, which which there is an indication that this may be happening, then. That has, to, that has to feature within the management of the site, potentially in the eradication of the St. Kilda mice. But it's far too early just now. 
it's an indication. Um, there's other sort of uh, signs that it might be happening. You know, bird rangers potentially seeing that chicks have actually died overnight and been scavenged. You know, is that a coincidence or does it point to something a little bit darker? So yeah, as much as they are uh, a nice animal, and um, whether or not they're they're a, they're we know that they're non-native species because they only arrived two thousand years ago. But what we don't know is are they invasive? Are they having a detrimental impact? on the biodiversity and that's something we need to keep a watch and brief on. So seabirds, um, I mean this a, lot, a big part of what St Kilda is about is the seabirds and um, you know there's puffins, uh, I've mentioned a few of the other stars, Manx Sheer Water etc earlier on. Uh, we also have the, I mean from some of the cliffs you can just see, um, I mean there's three huge populations of seabirds that you can see, you can see the foamers in the foreground, in the background you can see um, Stack and Armin and Stack Lee and Borrowry, um, which is basically, I mean, that's the blue-eyed boy of the archipelago in my eyes. It's a stunning set of um, sea stacks. But at the top, um, you can see it's very, very white there. Now, um, you'd be forgiven to think that that was geological, but actually it's, um, it's hundreds of thousands of gannets that are all sitting atop um, that one little rock. Um, so um, it's got about one third of the population of, of Great British gannets just, just in uh, that series of sea stacks. Likewise, um, down along here, um, you can see there's a ridge um, with a lot of white staining. And there's, that's where a lot of the black guillemots and common guillemots would have nested. So really, really important place. Seabirds eking out um, their own individual niches within um, the, uh, the cliff faces. And of course, um, the petrels of, uh, uh, this is the, um, the leeches storm petrel. Just here. So this, um, there, there's a lot of boxes that are up there that are um, that are basically for these birds. These are the birds that were sort of concerned that the mice might be predating. And um, so we had some camera traps up in and around where the nest site was. Um, there was no indications that potentially uh, it was going on, uh, but um, it's something that needs to be kept an eye on. This is the National Trust uh, for Scotland Ranger, um, just basically monitoring the development of these birds, um, so we get an idea of what food they're eating, um, how, how, how much they're doing well, basically it's to help determine productivity and, and development. And likewise, um, when I was across in 2021, and um, we had the RSPB for Scotland over, and this was a really nice bit of information that they sent out over Twitter um, from the RSPP science account. And basically what they started doing was started taking some of these birds, tagging them um, with little satellite tags, and finding exactly where it was that they were foraging. Now, this is a big, this is an important part of conservation these days, because what we need to know is where are these birds going um, in order to protect their fishing grounds, um, where these areas that they're, that they're foraging in. Um, and it's only become, going to become more and more important with uh, climate change and determining whether or not these stocks are moving. If the stocks begin to move, for example, is that going to lead to increased energy expenditure for these birds, which of course are very often already on the knife edge of survival. If it means increased energy, then how is that going to affect the, um, the birds' uh, chance of well, conservation attempts um, to, to protect them, you know? And of course, marine animals. Uh, this is this is something I was very excited about. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you watch and I'll chat after. So as many of you have guessed, that's a Baskin shark and it's only a small one. That Baskin shark in particular was about two and a half meters. I have walked across so many headlands in Donegal and Mayo and Galway looking for these blighters. So I, have, I can't tell you how much time I've wasted. And this fella swam into the bay on my lunch break. <laughs> it was incredible. Now he was, he was alongside a, a nine meter Baskin shark, which didn't sp stay too long there, but you talk about incredible animals. I was so, so chuffed to get the opportunity to go there. Now I will say they are protected. And um, that picture was taken basically with me hanging in the water and allowing the Baskin shark to come uh, towards me and do its own thing, um, just to prevent um, any disturbance. But my God, what, what, an, uh, what a fantastic looking animal. Now, a lot of the um, other habitats and features of interest are a bit more subtle. The sea caves and reef habitats are something that we don't see much of, but they're no less special. Um, St Kilda has, St Kilda's internationally important for various different sea cave habitats. 
Um, and there was a really nice wee video put together by SNH and Harriet Watt Uni uh, that, uh, where they went scuba diving. And you can check that out on BBC. That'll show you some of the rest of the animals that are there. Um, now, I wanted to point that out. This is the reason why St Kilda is a special area of conservation, because I'm going to talk about it in a wee bit more detail later on. Well, in fact, now. So the potential effects of climate change. Now, this is an island that's, as I say, 100 miles away. Um, Whenever you go out there, you're, I mean, the nearest place you've got are, are the Outer Hebrides. I calculated it, you're about 40 miles away from the nearest bar. So you're talking about really isolated now. Um, climate change is going to have an impact on St. Kilda. I mean, we're, we're, we're concerned that there are significant potential issues that may arrive, arise. Um, we, I've already talked about the seabirds um, and the potential for climate change to affect prey availability. Ocean, ocean chemistry changing um, could affect the ability of crustaceans to form their uh, the calcium carbonate required for their shells. Um, increased frequency of storms is likely to prolong the recovery of animal communities and, 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 and marine communities that are affected by the, you know, by, by the increased intensity of storms, which is also uh, anticipated. Now, those increased intensity will result in the, the removal of kelp, the animal communities, you know, the crabs, the, 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 um, the various different um, crustaceans and the various different other animals that make up these communities. Um, it's also likely to result in increased sea cave collapses. Um, as well as that, you know, one thing that we, we're not talking about here in climate change, but things like plastic pollution. You know, when we were out there, there was a boat that arrived across from Maine. So increased intensity is likely to lead to more of this sort of debris um, coming across um, the Atlantic. And with that debris comes the risk of uh, potential non-native invasives. So you have two different issues there dovetailing um, and being accentuated by climate change, both the plastic pollution and also the invasive species that have settled in so much of the, of the world's uh, communities now. And climate change has the potential to accentuate that and create almost like a, a type of meltdown um, where places like St. Kilda become, to beget, or become a little bit more uh, at risk from these issues. So as, um, as the guys mentioned, um, I'm on Cost in the Earth. Uh, feel free to check it out. There's loads of lovely sound in there um, from the seabirds and from the time in the community. Uh, so it's, it's, it's up now on the website. You can check it out. And at that, I'll leave you and thank you and ask you if you have any questions. Well, that was amazing. Thank you so much for giving us such a comprehensive overview of a really magical and special place, um, which I think St Kilda has probably held that place in all of our minds. I know it certainly did for mine, and I was so excited to hear from you, so thank you. Um, we do think about St Kilda as this protected and remote and faraway place, and I think you've managed to really bring into stark relief how scary it is that these changes are affecting even somewhere like that. I mean, the threat of plastic pollution in St Kilda feels like something that should never happen. Um, so thank you, I really appreciate that. I think we'll get some great questions later on about that one as yeah, well. No problems. But for now, Karis, if I could hand over to you and we'll have a discussion about the role of peatlands and terrain um, and the role yes. of the carbon centre. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm very excited to share my love for peatlands. So let me just grab my PowerPoint. Here we go. Okay, uh, so wow, Connor, that was a really amazing talk, especially about the mice. I found that really interesting. Um, in my talk, I'm going to be focusing on just the one habitat, peatlands. Um, and the reason I want to talk about peatlands in particular is because whenever I think about my life and the things that have influenced my life in terms of nature, it always comes back to peatlands. So when I was eight years old, I moved up to the north coast of Scotland. And in there, there's a lot of deep peat, which just means uh, it's over 0 0.5 metres deep. And on top of that, we were a crofting house. And in Scotland, you get crofting rights, which means that we had uh, rights to uh, nearby land to cut peat. Um, and so it was a very traditional relationship with the land until my dad decided it was too much work because it is a lot of work to cut and dry the peat and then cart it all home. Um, and then it, it wasn't until I uh, graduated university and I went to um, work on RSV for SNAD as a residential volunteer there that I learned a lot about the science of peelings. So Force Nard Flows is again in the north of Scotland, it's, so it's near where I grew up. Um, and it has a lot of these peatlands, a lot of deep peat. Um, a lot of the times it has forestry on them as well. And so I was learning a lot about why that wasn't good for our peatlands. Um, and it really imparted on me the ore um, that I feel for my peatlands. That's what I want to share with you today. 
So first off, what is peat? So peat is a substance like soil. You're going to find it in the ground in particular uh, conditions. Uh, a peatland is usually categorized by these types of plants called sphagnum mosses. Um, and so when these sphagnum mosses die, they don't actually decay and, and get broken down like they would, say, in a compost pile or the leaf litter in your garden or something like that. And they don't get broken down because the land is waterlogged. So peatland is a wetland. Um, so it has more uh, in, in common with my marine biology degree from Sterling than you might have first think. So this wetland nature I means there's no oxygen there. Uh, and so that normal cycling of nutrients uh, doesn't actually take place. And so because this material isn't broken down, it stores this really this high organic matter uh, in the peat. And that is what the peat is. Uh, and when we're talking about peatlands, we're talking about climate change, they're so important because not only do they sequester this carbon dioxide, so as the plants are growing, they, they take in the carbon dioxide from the air and they chemically convert that into carbon molecules to grow, but they, then they store that. So because they don't get broken down, they store this and they lock this carbon away in peatlands. Um, and year upon year upon year, with some natural variation, these peatlands can continue to take that carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in our peatlands. And this is different when you compare it to another habitat like woodlands, because in a woodland, although the rate of the sequestration is faster, uh, when that woodland is matured, those trees aren't really growing very much, that that rate just kind of plummets and drops off, whereas in a peatland it keeps going. Uh, and so when we're talking about climate change, we're always talking about this sort of carbon management, you know, we've got too much carbon dioxide and equivalent gases in our atmosphere, and we need to take some of that out to uh, tackle climate change. And so peatlands are a big, big part of this strategy. And this is why more and more they're being recognized and put into our net zero strategies uh, a lot in Scotland, but also in the UK as a whole. And they're part of our net zero strategies because unfortunately, you might have noticed I said healthy peatlands sequester and store carbon. Unfortunately, a lot of our peatlands in the UK are not healthy. About 80% of them degraded. And this is a substantial amount of land. In Scotland alone, 20% of our land surface is peatland. Um, so wherever you live in Scotland, you're probably a stone's throw away from peatland, and whether you know it or not. Um, and what happens, this graph is showing us what happens uh, when a peatland is unhealthy. So that water table has dropped, it's no longer waterlogged. And so that cycling of materials, that breaking down of uh, the plant and releasing that carbon back into the air takes place. But also when a peat when peat is uh, released to the air, it oxidizes and it becomes crumbly. And when that rain then comes into the peatland and through the peatland, it washes that crumbled peat away into our waters and that becomes dissolved organic carbon. And that has impacts on our water quality. It makes it more expensive to treat that water for drinking water. Um, and it also means that the species living in that water suffer, like the fish spawning grounds, for example, they get heavily impacted if this peat gets washed through. And then finally, some of that peat that gets washed through then goes undergoes the sort of decay process. But again, because there's not much oxygen in that water, it becomes methane. Uh, so the same sort of process that happens, you know, in a cow's stomach or food waste sent to landfill, um, natural materials breaking down with oxygen. And methane, as I'm sure many of you know, is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, and so when our peatlands are unhealthy, they're actually emitting a huge amount of carbon. And in the UK, 4% of our annual greenhouse gas emissions come from peatlands, and that's a substantial amount. So if you can imagine, not only are peatlands no longer um, taking income from the atmosphere, but they're actually giving it back out. So they're not a carbon sink, they're a carbon source. And this is true worldwide as well. A lot of our peatlands in the world have been uh, altered in some way, not the same sort of percentage as we find in the UK, because a lot of our land is peatland. And uh, a lot of that land has been used for agriculture, like in the southeast of England, forestry in the north, especially in Scotland, and then also some harvesting of peat for industrial fuel and sort of the horticulture industry. So essentially any plant that you buy in a pot is probably sitting in peat compost. That peat has been taken out of the peatland and that peatland has been degraded because of it. Uh, and so worldwide, this is the story that's repeated um, and it's about 56 I think that's right, yeah, 5.6% of our uh, global anthropogenic CO2 emissions are from peelings. And that what I wanna draw your attention to is that 1.3 gigatons um, figure. Now compare that to our healthy peelings 
Our healthy peatlands worldwide are estimated to store about 550 gigatons of carbon. So if that peatland gets degraded, that carbon is going to get released to the atmosphere and we're going to take a huge step back in terms of tackling climate change. And so that's why it's really important to keep those peatlands healthy and to get our degraded peatlands into a healthier state. Okay, this is the part of the talk where I say, oh, we can all do our part. Now, obviously, we don't have much to say in what peatlands, what happens to our peatlands in terms of the restoration work. I can say in Scotland, uh, they have uh, announced, uh, I think in May, that the government will commit 250 million pounds over the next 10 years to restoring our peatlands. And we have huge targets in Scotland to meet uh, as part of the net zero strategy and, and just general uh, biodiversity goals. And this is repeated somewhat throughout the UK. Um, England doesn't have the same sort of overarching body um, of our peatlands um, that Scotland does, but it does have a lot of, um, say, like national trust properties, wildlife trust properties, um, and, and uh, so on that have peatland in them. So they are kind of being done in a more local way. Um, so that's, that's great. That's what's kind of happening overall in the UK. And hopefully that will be the trend worldwide as we, as we learn more about our peatlands and how, how important they are for climate change. But us individually, what we can do and what actually does make a big difference is to choose peat-free compost when we're gardening or asking our gardening friends and family to do that. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the horticulture industry is a big reason why our peatlands are getting harvested. Now, that's not so much the case in the UK. As with many things, we have outsourced this um, and we are degrading other people's peatlands for this industry. Um, and if you go peat-free compost, not only is this not a drop in quality, but it's often not a drop in price either. Um, and it's a very powerful choice to make. Um, and you know, it's sort of that individual voting, voting power with our money um, can be very powerful. Um, and as COP26 is coming up as well, we're really hoping that peelings are on the agenda or at least talked about somewhat because they are a success story for Scotland. Um, Scotland's kind of a few years ahead of where England is because of this overarching body. Uh, but more and more peelings across the UK are going to be uh, restored throughout things like the peatland code, which is a carbon offsetting mechanism uh, and so on. So we really want it to be talked about more uh, for, for one to get Scotland and, and the rest of the UK to really get on board and, and continue to protect our peatlands, doing things like making peat compost um, banned um, or, or other uh, sort of management techniques on peatlands that maybe aren't very helpful to them banned and then that, that globally. Um, but in, as individuals, you know, if we continue to talk about peatlands and uh, we share peatlands with our friends and families, because as, a, as I say in Scotland, you're probably quite close to peatlands, and that can be a really powerful tool um, that we as individuals can do for our peatlands. So uh, I'll stop there uh, before I wish on too much about peatlands, because I really could talk about it all day. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it back over to uh, Fiona there. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Paris, thank you so much. Um, as you say, as someone who has uh, grown up in Scotland, I think I have spent all of my days thinking about peat without realising it, but I've never thought about peat in quite the ways that you pointed out today. So that was hugely helpful and I really, really enjoyed uh, hearing from that from you. And we've had a couple of questions come in as well. Um, so we're going to come back to you on that so you can get your thinking cap on about how, about how to answer them. But we'll move from Scottish peat to Canadian forests and so much more with Holly Palin. Holly, can I hand over to you to finish today's presentations off? Yes, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was really impressed with the other presentations. I don't have beautiful photos, but I will share some um, reflections and thoughts from um, my career, I guess, and how Sterling played a part in that and try to come up with some takeaways that we can reflect on as we think about um, the role of uh, public engagement and values in how we decide to manage our um, spaces and our species. So um, I was lucky to spend a semester abroad at Sterling um, and obviously the you know most um, obvious thing at first was just the stunning um, landscape having the mountains and hills and um, <clears throat> beautiful campus was extremely inspiring as a place to study and um, I was also really impressed with the academic approach. I really valued sort of the independent research nature that was expected, and that set me up well for my uh, master's degree that I did later. And um, currently my role is the Director of Innovation and Youth Engagement at Environment and Climate Change Canada. 
And that is the federal department that's responsible for advancing a lot of um, policy, science, regulation related to environment and climate objectives at the federal government level in Canada. And um, I wanted to pick up on that theme of engagement in this presentation today and talk about, um, first of all, kind of what um, inspired me about the opportunity to live and study in Scotland and a little bit of the contrast between what I observed in Canada and Scotland. And also, um, you know, why engagement is so important to um, advancing conservation objectives. So I'll talk briefly about um, five experiences that stuck with me to try to draw out some key messages related to our topic today. <clears throat> so um, growing up here in Canada, I was really lucky to have parents that lived the outdoors and spent a lot of time um, camping, you know, time by lakes, by oceans and mountains and so on. And that really created that appreciation for nature. And so when I was in high school at the time, there was a lot of um, citizen science based uh, programs running at different levels of government. And so I spent time uh, volunteering, doing things like um, bat surveys, frog surveys, bird surveys. And um, what was really interesting about that is it gave me, I guess, the confidence that I could be a scientist, I could contribute to science, and that led me to study environmental science um, at the University of Guelph, which maybe some of you have been to as a semester abroad student. Um, and essentially the sort of takeaway that I have from that experience is that those kind of citizen science programs can create a pathway to ecological understanding, particularly for youth, and can open up career possibilities and um, give young people the confidence to pursue careers in science, which is so critical to um, advancing conservation objectives and also creating um, people who are well equipped to participate in the green economy. Um, I guess the second experience I want to talk about was being at Sterling and um, I immediately joined the outdoors club <laughs> so I could go hiking and discover the country. And that really led me to think about the contrast between the landscapes in Canada and Scotland. And you know, what appeared to me at first to be completely wild spaces, um, you know, in the highlands and things like that, I realized over time had been affected over such a long history of human habitation and um, made me think about what is the kind of, what is it that we are protecting? Are we protecting static kind of landscapes? Um, and what is worth protecting. And um, it also made me sort of have an appreciation for in Canada, we still, you know, have a lot of, or had at the time, a lot of um, wild spaces. And it made me kind of think about our responsibility as Canadians to um, make sure that we are protecting those important habitats for our own citizens, but also for the global ecosystem benefits and environmental benefits um, that they provide. And I remember one of the um, really interesting experiences I had was, um, I think it was in ecology, we went on a field trip to see, you know, a hillside where they um, excluded grazing sheep and things like that, and um, to see what kinds of um, habitat would, would come back when it was undisturbed. And there was a lot of diversity in species that they weren't expecting um, sort of there. And um, a lot of different uh, tree species as well. And so thinking about that, like what, what, um, what kind of nature do we want to have? Um, how do we balance those areas that need to be managed for human benefits, as well as areas that we want to manage for nature benefits, um, led me to think and focus on forest management and how do we make those decisions? Who gets to have a say? And what objectives are we managing for? And so that led me to study um, sustainable forest management at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia is um, New Scotland. So there's a connection there too. It's a beautiful place. It's on our East Coast. It's a very coastal province, um, many diverse landscapes, a lot of um, <clears throat> endangered species and unique habitats, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, when I was studying there, what I really wanted to look at was that community engagement. So what are the roles of um, community actors and different stakeholders in influencing land management? Particularly in Canada, we have a lot of public land, which is crown land or land managed on behalf of um, 
the queen um, for the public good and um, is managed at the provincial level or federation, um, obviously. And um, I looked at different models of stakeholder engagement that brought together people with different perspectives, whether that be um, industrial, economic, tourism, um, education, et cetera, to think about you know, whether there are common values and how um, discussions and thinking about those values, but also scientific evidence can then influence change and in decision-making at the local and regional level. Um, and it led me to realize that um, those kind of processes are really important to come up with and influence kind of common objectives and, and allow for a more um, long-term approach, I suppose, to how we, we manage our forests. Um, coming out of that experience, I really wanted to have a more practical kind of impact, not just study engagement and study forest management, but think about, okay, how can we as citizens make a difference? And so I ended up volunteering on a board of an NGO. It's called the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. And its objective there is to um, establish more protected areas. So obviously there are huge international commitments right now to create and make sure that um, we have um, significant protected areas to make sure that nature can, can last and sustain itself into the future despite changes like climate change. And so that was an experience in um, <clears throat> working from the outside to try to influence policy and to try to bring the voice of average citizens to the decision-making table. One of the things that I realized through that experience is who is participating and whose voices are being heard is not necessarily inclusive or representative of, of all voices. And so one of the things we did through that experience was um, think about urban youth and how there was kind of a gap in the ability of some populations to access nature and therefore also be advocates for nature. So we created um, some opportunities for urban youth to go on wilderness excursions. And um, I really think that that type of experience is, is important as a society to enable and allow um, equal access to nature. Um, from there, I went into government to try to make change from the inside and work on policy. And I've been really lucky to work on um, sustainable forest management, working on invasive species and other topics. And again, the, the, one of the key messages I learned through that was the value of bringing different perspectives together. That if you're going to make um, change and have an impact, particularly on forest health and addressing issues associated with climate change, you have to look at the very broad scale level. And that requires bringing scientists together. It means bringing people together from multiple levels of government, whether that's municipal, regional, provincial, national, and yet you also need that international cooperation. So there has to be a lot of willingness to collaborate, a lot of willingness um, to share ideas and, and, um, and find compromises. Um, and lastly, I would say that, um, you know, while it's so critical to work at those international and national levels, at the end of the day, what we've seen through COVID is also that most people really experience what's in their backyards. And Kara's talked about this, being close to peatlands. Um, you know, and what matters to, to most people in their day-to-day -day life and their sort of day-to-day -day well-being is having access to parks and green spaces in their neighborhoods. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things I did was participate on an advisory body at my local government to try to give advice on municipal decision-making related to protected areas to make sure that like local parks and local um, important areas are protected despite you know, the intense pressure of densification and urban development. And so I guess in terms of the overall takeaways I wanted to share, and I'll wrap up in a minute, are, are four key things. So one is when we think about um, engagement with nature, it's really important to create opportunities for youth to experience wilderness and to have opportunities to engage in nature for their own well-being, but also um, as a strategy really to ensure that um, people are willing to make behavioral change later in life. Another thing is citizen science can be really powerful 
as a tool to support young people choosing careers in science and conservation. Um, and also helps to create that talent pool that will support our economies as the green economy becomes more and more important. Um, as leaders, if we're, we have the power to create engagement opportunities, it's important to make sure that they are equitable and they create opportunities for diverse voices to be heard. And um, finally, that on a personal level, engagement is a powerful antidote to eco-anxiety and being overwhelmed <laughs> by the number of challenges that we face um, with climate change and with biodiversity. And so, you know, engagement can be at many levels from your backyard actions to engagement with your local municipality to advocating for change at broader um, policy levels, but whatever way you choose to get involved, it can make a difference. So I will just end there and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Holly, not at all. Thank you for speaking with us. It's been really useful, I think, to hear about the, the similarities and the differences, um, but I think you know, more commonalities than not in the challenges that we're all facing. That whole thing about, you know, different levels of government, uh, that what impacts you right at home, right up to what's going to be an international collaboration to get the solutions to, to challenges that are facing us all, you know, as, as Connor touched on right at the start nowhere is immune to to these problems so thank you so much this has been such a such a really enjoyable opportunity to get some very different experiences in here and i also like as well that you've three of you in different ways have touched on the the career aspect of this as well that this is something that we do need to have younger people involved in we need to have them involved in for lots of different reasons and the green economy is is a vital part of that i think it takes things away from being um you know oh, isn't it isn't it a nice thing to do to be involved in the environment to be actually this is where the jobs of the future are and this is where the practical practical solutions that are going to save all of our economies are so really exciting but this isn't about me wittering on and um, I think we will open to questions we've had loads going on in the chat and in the Q&A so if the three of you are happy to to answer some questions let's see what we've got going on in the chat Jen do you have any questions in from our audience hi yes um there's one there um Robert has asked all panellists, uh, Robert Dubsky, hello, has asked um, what contribution did you slash Scotland slash UK or Canada make to COP15, the UN Biodiversity Conference this month? Um, let's start with um, Karis. Uh, I'll be just a short answer. Um, I am not sure what Scotland did uh, for the conference. My expertise really relates to COP26 uh, because the organisation I work with, um, we're doing a lot with that in particular, um, but I, I can't really speak on what Scotland has, um, has been doing in terms of, of that one, I'm afraid. So nice to answer. <laughs> Hi, I mean, or Connor or, or Holly? Sure, um, I can just briefly say um, that our government has been really, really focused on um, meeting protected areas targets. It's been a huge area of focus and work um, within our country in terms of working as, as I alluded to, like all levels of government to look at where are those opportunities for creating additional protected spaces so that we can meet our targets. Um, as that requires a lot of um, negotiation, a lot of consultation, particularly with indigenous peoples, um, as well as different layers of government. Um, and there has been an increasing, um, I guess, understanding that protected areas need to be, or many into, um, protected areas um, need to be managed by Indigenous populations as well who live in those landscapes. And so that's an important piece. And just another kind of anecdote or example is that our government has also invested quite a lot in opportunities for youth to connect with um, nature through funding um, programs that are led by NGOs. Um, those are just a couple of examples. Yeah, Jennifer, I'll, uh, I'll jump in there as well. I mean, I guess it's, it's, it's I think the, the, the policy framework that, that happens at such a high level at the United Nations, trying to draw strands from what exactly the information base that's being used for those sorts of discussions is kind of like you know, trying to withdraw an egg from a, you know, a, a scrambled egg as such, you know, it's kind of like, or an omelette. Um, there's so much evidence, so much information that, that goes into conversations up on that level. And while I'm not going to be winding down, 
at the cop level, you know, we've all done, I'd say even, you know, even the, a lot of the attend, attendees will have done their part as well, engaged in political action, you know, uh, been working with local politicians uh, to try and bring down the United Nations um, a resolution that, you know, we have 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the of the, of the United, of the world's surface is protected by 2030. There's no reason why local councils can't be engaged on that. Um, we've got a local councillor that I've been working with that's trying to um, push that now at a council level, even in Belfast, looking at the green spaces and saying, look at the council land, and say, what can we do to bring that to bring that thread, that resolution down into local action? And as well as that, I mean, don't forget about all of the citizen science surveys that Holly sort of alluded to. All that information goes in, provides a picture of where biodiversity is, and uh, that all feeds up um, into into the hodgepodge that goes on at these high level um, these high level meets. So we all we all play our part. And um, there's a, a couple in here from Francis. Um, probably to, to everyone, um, has COVID helped engagement in a positive way, or do you have any other experiences over the last eighteen months? Um, um, Holly, we'll sure, I can just start. Um, yeah, one of the things that obviously COVID has done is enable us to connect virtually. And so in some ways in talking to my colleagues working on different conservation programs or um, engagement opportunities, in some ways it's enabled um, a greater and more equal participation um, by many individuals in those kind of opportunities to influence decision-making and direction. So. I'm not sure if that's responding exactly to your question, but I think that is certainly one benefit that we've seen, and I think um, we'll be able to take those lessons forward. Yeah, I would I would concur. I mean, I think uh, there's there's a couple of notable points I would probably that, that that I remember reading about that that really struck me. First of all, was just the value that um, people now place within green spaces within uh, towns and cities. Um, I had a tale of two lockdowns. I was caught in Donegal for the first, and then I was caught in, in, in the house that I'm, I'm in now, just in an inner city area in, in urban Belfast. And it was two very different experiences, I have to say. Um, so there's a lot more interest in, in people putting value on, on green spaces. I think there was a wider recognition of, of wildlife um, from that perspective. And also, you know, I think because of the decreased footfall, we started hearing success stories of, for example, I know the National Trust in Norfolk had a really successful year with little turns because of um, a drop in the number of uh, dog walkers. So there was there were stories that actually accentuate uh, some of the impacts that maybe indirectly we're having on wildlife that we don't even know about. Um, and also the value of, uh, of, of spaces that traditionally we might only have put a real estate value on. Coming in for a more um, rural um, view on things. So the first lockdown here, I wasn't with the carbon, the carbon centre. I was actually with um, Lang Initiative, which is a very similar organisation. I was running an environmental education project. Um, and so Langham is in Dumfries and Galloway. It's a very rural town. So it has a lot of wild spaces around it. But we're still finding that young people still aren't really that connected with the wild spaces. However, at this, well, towards um, the middle of lockdown, we started um, making sort of these family packs that got posted out uh, to families who signed up with sort of activities and ways that they could engage with nature in a little bit more um, of, a, of a routine or like kind of um, with like a recipe, you know, like they were following instructions because a lot of the times the young people aren't you know engaging with the rural spaces because their adults aren't necessarily either they don't there's a lot of fear around nature even within rural spaces and we found that was really successful um and then when i was with the common center and we were doing some environment education post um sort of the lockdowns uh, so this was in this summer we were finding it was really hard to get numbers of people out um so i don't know if that's because they they were more confident engaging with nature on their own or because people didn't want to um, come out still, there was still some of that, that kind of lingering fear, uh, which is very understandable. So a bit of a mixed bag that, um, and I, I don't know if we'll really get any solid um, kind of answers about that until further out of it, and we can kind of look back and look at the statistics and all of that. Um, There's a, a question here is for Connor, 
Um, Connor, you mentioned hedgehogs on St Kilda as being non-native. What was done with them, if anything, given hedgehog numbers have plummeted? Yeah, so um, thankfully we, we never had any incursions of hedgehogs arriving on St Kilda. Um, you know, th there are issues with hedgehogs in use. Um, in, with hedgehogs in New Zealand, where they've been introduced, uh, where they've been predating uh, bird eggs, for instance. Now, we, we didn't have any issues with uh, that sort of an incursion um, on St Kilda, thankfully. The only, the only native mammal that's really considered for St Kilda is, um, is the Grey Seal and Common Seal. You know, there's, there's nothing else that, that's out there um, that, that's mammalian, really, that, that made it across. So I guess, in short, uh, we never had an incursion event. If we had of, um, then we would have been left with two choices, uh, either translocation back to Great Britain somewhere or um, dispatch. Um, effectively, once an animal's in your care, you're responsible for its, its, um, its welfare. Uh, to be honest, I think I would have struggled to dispatch. I would have, uh, I mean, I, I didn't mention this, but whenever I was in St Kilda, I actually found a racing pigeon from Derry that I managed to get on a boat to Castle Rock. So <laughs> I would have tried other measures, but um, you know, it, we, we couldn't say that we couldn't have, have dispatched it, but we would have looked at other options. Thanks, Connor. Um, we will go into the Q&A um, section. There's quite a few here. Um, First one, I think this will be more for you, Karis. Um, peat takes many years to develop, so how can they be restored to provide a carbon sink, as is sometimes suggested? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, so uh, you get different categories of peat, um, and you can only restore it to the condition above. So a lot of the peatland that we're focusing on in Scotland, um, on behalf of Peatland Action, which is part of Nature Scot, previously Scotland's natural heritage, uh, is this actively eroding category of peat. So this is the carbon source. And we are trying to fix that into, uh, I think the next condition up is just drained. Um, and then once we've done that with a lot of our peatlands, we'll be focusing on the drained peatland and putting them on the next character category, which I think is modified. Um, but the, the key is, even though it takes a year to give you a one millimeter of peat, um, if that peat is healthy, it is still sequestering your carbon dioxide. And it is um, kind of slower rates than, than the woodlands, but it is year upon year upon year with some natural flux in there. Um, so this restoration work is a really like restored it is kind of like an umbrella term and um, what you'd be aiming for is first off to stop the, those emissions and then put them put the peat in a category where it can start making more peat again so even though it's very slow it would still be restored and it would become a carbon sink rather than a carbon source honor or holly do you have anything to add or should i move on okay uh, next one is for you again, Karis. Um, if peatlands are replaced by forests, is it worse, equivalent, better in terms of um, carbon emissions? If peatlands are more effective, can we not just put more down as a cheaper alternative to carbon capture? Yes. So if the, there's this thing coming out in the UK now, the sort of policy of the right tree, right place. Um, and the idea behind that is depending on your soil type, whether that's peatland or a different soil type, there will be the best trees to put on that um, to make the most, you know, um, sort of carbon sequestration. In a peatland, especially on deep peat, which in England is 0 0.4 metres, in Scotland is 0 0.5 metres deep, um, you, you're not supposed to plant on that because we now know that putting that forestry plantations like the Sitka spruce and stuff um, is very bad for the peatlands. That actually makes those peatlands into a carbon source. Um, and so uh, that was happening a lot in the 80s because of like kind of government tax benefits and stuff to planting these forests. Um, and now they're coming up to being felled. Not only is the timber really bad quality on the peat because it's it's very nutrient poor in a peatland. Um, but, you know, obviously now we, we know not to plant again. So instead of restocking, um, sometimes they'll if they're able to, they will restore that peatland instead. Um, and work with, you know, sort of landowners or forestry commission or, or whatever it is, whatever body it is that's looking at that and restoring it. Um, and the peatlands won't really get replaced by forest. The peatlands are still underneath that forest. 
they're just really heavily modified and uh, not growing more peat. And then in terms of uh, sort of putting more down um, for carbon capture, um, you, we can't like synthesize peat ourselves. It's a natural process. Um, and the, in a peatland, it really depends on the conditions of the land that it's in. So we can't really go in and, and make conditions suitable for a peatland that's, that isn't naturally there anyway. Um, what we can do is, is make those peatlands that we do know exist uh, healthy so that they can keep you know, becoming a carbon sink and maybe expand over a process of many, many years. Um, unfortunately, sort of this idea of carbon capture, um, it's, it's really tricky. Carbon capture, sort of the um, big schemes, they don't, they don't really work um, you know, on a big level, but in terms of our nature's potential to be a carbon capture, it's not just peatlands that are in there. It's also woodlands, it's also other soils that are organically rich. Um, so, so P isn't the only answer there, basically, um, just trying to restore habitats and, and make our places of nature healthy in the first place will, will help on the grand scheme of things as well. I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Karis. Um, we've got another one here from uh, Roger, um, for everyone actually. Um, with COP26 next week, do you agree that everyone who cares about loss of biodiversity and climate change should personally contact their political representatives and make sure they know their views? Um, Connor, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, politicians are absolutely key. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, particularly here in Northern Ireland, we get a lot of uh, tired vitriol uh, directed towards politicians and and, and political instability at times, you know, very often we look at Scotland actually and sort of aspire to have a democracy as mature as, as what's going on in Hollywood or Hollywood. But um, I do think that there are good politicians um, there and the, 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 the critical thing is actually trying to find the ones that are that are inspired enough to take forward the cause. I mentioned an example where we had a local councillor that off the back of his work um, we managed to push for a 30 by 30 um, within the council. So we're looking at green spaces and looking at the rewilding of green spaces in Belfast and in, in an area that traditionally would have been very, very, um, uh, I guess, very, very conservative in, in terms of the management of these green spaces that would have been kept like lawns. We've managed to get this through. Um, in Ards and North Down, I worked with a community group and a couple of years ago, we were working with uh, red squirrels in Pine Martin. We were seeing a lot of grey squirrels coming over from parks managed by the council. They have agreed to allow uh, grey squirrel control on their woodland to allow us to protect the red squirrels. I mean, I think politicians are absolutely critical. Um, one of the things I would say is that it very often helps to have a platform. And a really good way of doing that is by cohesing together as a community group, uh, because you then have a number of different people that think like you, you're no longer just uh, like the weirdo um, from 139. Uh, you now have a, an actual collective that's that's aspiring to do something. And that really helps. It helps demonstrate action uh, because you can do projects yourselves, but it actually also allows you to get people in place. Whenever they come knocking the doors, you're not the only one asking about it. Whenever it comes to send an email to lobby, you're not the only one doing a, doing something about it. So I think politicians are absolutely critical and that's at all levels. Thanks, Connor. Um, Karis, do you want to come in there? Yeah, just a quick point to add. In uh, Scotland, I believe most local councils have announced the climate emergency and they've made targets to become net zero, like Dumfries and Galloway's target in 2025. And as part of this, they'll hopefully have uh, an environment champion or team or, or you know, councillor that's kind of in charge of, of this. And that would be a really good point of contact. Uh, in Dumfries Gala, we have Dougie Campbell, who is fantastic. Um, he's got the rest of the council to do carbon literacy training. Um, and he's got a team working with him now to, um, you know, really change the way the council works and, and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, look for those key people, as, as Connor was saying. And as well, um, yeah, telling the politicians what you think, what, what you would vote for is really powerful, especially as a young voter, because there's so many young people who do not uh, participate in that process, that if you let them know that you are a young person who is taking part in this in this uh, 
you know, democracy, uh, then they'll, you know, you have weight, your words have weight. Um, even if it's a generic email that you get a template off from, you know, a petition website or something like that, it still has weight. And I would definitely recommend people doing it, even like, you know, once every couple of months or something, just to remind politicians that you're out of the hair and you're, you know, you're listening to what they're doing. Thanks, Karis. Holly, do you have anything else to add? I think those are really excellent points. I think the only other thing is to note, I guess, from my experience that, yes, um, you know, those letters get noted from a government perspective, at least from my experience, you know, they get logged, the issues get tracked, um, people in government have to respond to them. So um, there is certainly in addition to the other ways that were uh, mentioned by participating in groups and communities and influencing your local level, um, you know, though voicing your opinion does, does get noted. Thanks, everyone there. Um, another uh, set of questions from Arlene. Uh, Connor, these are uh, mostly directed to you. I will try and break them down. There's quite a few here. Um, in terms of the mouse scavenging, would predation not be the next natural evolutionary step for them to make? And could this be happening due to climate change impacting their original dietary requirements? There's one more bit. Also has dietary testing been done on the birds in the area to see if they could also be monopolizing some of the land rather than seafood sources? Yeah, um, good question. So, so if we look at what's happening with the St Kilda mice, um, if you think about the mice over here, uh, there's always a natural pressure which is influencing how animals evolve. It's like that old, it was like the media that came out recently that talked about how elephants are no longer sort of producing tusks almost because poaching has provided that sort of a pressure that the animals are responding to to survive. Now, it's the same thing with the, uh, the, the St. Kilda mice and St. Kilda. St. Kilda itself is a natural pressure um, that it's inflicting upon the mice. And only mice with certain characteristics will survive. Now, one of the reasons why the mice are getting bigger in St. Kilda is because predation is no longer the key issue. Um, instead, it's, it's exposure uh, to the elements, to the wind, to the rain, to the colder weather. Um, so because there's no foxes, because there's no uh, stoats, for instance, then what we're finding is that um, there's that release from predation. They no longer have to be small to get away from those predators. Now what they need to put up with is the cold weather. The best way of evolving to deal with that, and we've seen it time and time again with mice on islands, is that they get bigger because that bigger uh, volume to surface area ratio allows them to control their heat. It means that they're less exposed to cold so they can stay warmer. Now, if we take that to the next step, you're probably right in saying that the next evolutionary step will let that giganticism may continue to occur. The only other pressure on the St. Kilda mice at the moment is one, uh, well, we think it's just one snowy owl that's on the island, but that's unlikely to have that much of an impact. So it could be that in hundreds of years from now, thousands of years, the St. Kilda mice just continue to get bigger. And we've seen this with Gough Island, we've seen it with Marion Island, we've seen it with other different islands as well, where the mice are released from that predation pressure, they get bigger, and then they begin to carve out a new niche. Having said that, that's all theoretical. It may not translate into practice. It may be that mice or mice never actually adapt the behaviour um, to, uh, to take birds while they're alive. It's, it really becomes unknown uh, what way it's going to go. At the minute, there's plenty of um, dead sheep around. There's plenty of, uh, well, there's certainly dead carcasses of mice as well because of the, or, or dead carcasses of seabirds because of the skua. So it may be that they never actually try it. I don't know. Um, I don't know what way it go, what, what way it would go. Um, and re with regards to dietary testing, um, the only dietary testing that I've been aware of is microplastics. Um, so microplastics on great skua, uh, because skuas are effectively predating other birds, you know, are we seeing much in the way of um, uh, microplastics and plastics within uh, the, the, the pellets of great skua? Um, so that's the only one that I've done. Um, I don't think that birds are monopolizing any of the land sources. 
Uh, if you think about the, the seabirds that are on the island, most of them are specialists in terms of, you know, they go out to sea, they forage out, and that's where they spend most of their life. You know, the leeches, petrels, the manx shear water, the poppins, they only really come in, uh, and the great school as well, they only really come in uh, to land, uh, to breed, and then they disappear off again. So it would be a regressive step, I would have thought, because there isn't much in the way of food sources on St Kilda. The only birds that have adapted um, to take advantage of land food sources have been the skua. Um, around lambing season, you'll very often see them out harassing the, the soe lambs um, and basically trying to chase them down cliffs uh, so that they can eat the carcass sort of at, the, at, a, at below, you know, and you'll see them trying to hamstring the, the lambs on the, on the, on the moors. But that's the only ones that, uh, that have really adapted in any sort of which way to, to land sources. Thanks, Connor. Um, there are three more questions to go, and I'm conscious of time, so um, hopefully we'll, we'll get through them. Uh, this is another one from Arlene, um, asking about um, employment, and she's asking, would SEPA be the best entryway into the industry, or could you suggest other organisations that would be useful for future employment opportunities? Um, Karis, would you help with that one? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it, it would really depend on the industry um, that you have in mind. I mean, my industry would I would call more the third sector, the charity and, uh, and not, not the profit sector. Um, and the way I got into this industry was through uh, volunteering with the RSVB and then the National Trust. Um, it's, if, you, if you live in Scotland, Scotland has a really good uh, amount of community charities, like community development trusts, um, and um, you know, other not-for-profits that are working quite locally. Um, there's quite a lot of like local funds available, so that really builds up um, that kind of portfolio. Um, so it would be a good idea just to get in touch uh, with them and see if there's any sort of voluntary work that you could do or even like sort of apprenticeships or internships that you can do there. Um, in terms of sort of practical conservation skills, um, the RSBB and the National Trust do some residential volunteering uh, where if it's long term, you usually get you you get some accommodation um, there, and sometimes a small amount of, of money sort of for food every week and stuff. So um, there's those possibilities as well. Um, but but uh, yeah, I mean, there's I think there's no one route into this into this sector. Um, just really finding out what's out there and and what you want to do because it's quite. I mean, you could do practical conversation. You could do environmental education. You could do social media. You know, there's loads of routes into it. So it just depends on what your interests are and where they lie. Thanks, Caris. Um, the last few questions that we've got are for for the the three panel. Um, a question to all. It's from Andy. Do we have to accept the preservation of species or habitats is not always productive? If so, how do we enable adaptation to a future climate? Um, Holly, would you like to go first? Sure, um, that's an interesting question. I'm assuming that, um, Andy, what you mean by productive is productive in an economic sense, although I'm not, not sure if I'm interpreting your question correctly. Um, but in terms of um, the reasons and the rationale behind protecting species and spaces, there are so many objectives that can be accomplished through that protection, um, whether it be human health in terms of those opportunities for recreation, the benefits that are provided for water quality, air quality, uh, climate sinks, etc. They may not be productive in a traditional sense of contributing to um, actual products that go directly into the economy, but we realized that there are so many indirect economic benefits and that valuation of nature needs to account for those ecosystem services and those intangibles as well as the um, practical economic products that may have we have, we traditionally counted more and um, additionally the value obviously that comes from um, tourism has been increasingly important although that can have negative consequences as well um, and in terms of the adaptation to a future climate, I think it's it's clearly evident that adaptation requires change of behaviors at so many different levels, from individual choices to community level choices to choices by governments and also by um, industry sectors to influence the direction that we go in to create 
you know, economic systems and, and feedback mechanisms that allow for the generation of economic opportunities while also um, supporting that healthy future. Thanks, Holly. Um, Connor, do you, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I would. Um, I would. I would find the two of them uh, completely inseparable. Um, I mean, whenever we talk about adaptation to climate change, I think that it's important that we recognise that that's the very last gasp situation we should be in. We should be looking at preventing the worst instances, then we should be looking at mitigating, and then we should be looking at adaptation. Now, at every single stage of of that process of dealing with climate change, as such, we're going to need healthy ecosystems. You know, whether it's the prevention of the worst case scenario of climate change and the role that, uh, as Carries has mentioned, the peatlands have to have to have to provide. Is it the mitigation of the impacts of climate change, for instance, and looking and saying, well, okay, we're going to have warmer cities, then let's look at woodlands, um, urban woodlands, urban forestry as a way to mitigate that and get that sort of protective layer of, of evapotranspiration within our urban areas to, to cool down places. Or is it going to be about mitigation, for instance, or sorry, um, adaptation in that if we're going to stop flooding, then we need to start looking at uh, the recreation of wetlands um, in the in the upper drainage system, the upper parts of the channel. So, I mean, I think that three are, or it's completely inseparable um, adaptation or how we deal with climate change and, and the rec restoration of, of habitats. I do get, I have some, I have some sympathy for the, the you know, the, for the question, because at times we feel that we're, we're putting in so much effort and we're only moving backwards. But I guess the most important thing is that we have some degree of hope that things are going to change and hopefully a COP will uh, lay that on us, you know. Thanks, Connor. Um, Karis, do you want to come in there at the end? Yeah, I think um, I, I agree very much with what Connor and Holly were saying. Um, the only thing I would maybe add is, especially in terms of peatlands, so a lot of our um, fruit and veg in the UK comes from sort of the southeast and a lot of that land is peatland um, or sort of other uh, similar landscapes. Um, and what we would be looking to in the future is moving to more of a sort of a politiculture uh, idea so that they're partially submerged or something so that helps the peatland sort of heal a little bit and, and still be productive. Sometimes, unfortunately, we're not in an ideal world. So you do have to have that kind of compromise between the, the, the use of the habitat and keeping the habitat in a, in a good condition so that it you know can uh, can sort of survive climate change and, and be a bit resilient to things like that um but yeah i mean in terms of ecosystem services there is way more that we should be putting the sort of productive um umbrella over than just sort of money in the economy um there's like yeah it's, it's a huge part of there's there's other parts of the story that that make up that Thanks, Karis. Um, I think we're um, coming up to the end of our uh, webinar. We've got one more question, um, and it's for, for everyone again, from our anonymous attendee, whoever they may be. Is there much that is being done with technological innovation to assist in maintaining biodiversity? Connor, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think, the third sector should be applauded for this. Uh, I mean, there's quite a lot of, um, I mean, by new technology, I'm going to merge in new practices as well. And one of the things that we're seeing from the third sector are uh, this drive to, to, to acquire new skill sets, new technologies, apply new technologies in order to do the work we're doing now, whether it's something like conservation dogs that we're seeing, whether it's the concept of uh, species rich grassland restoration or the, the impact that we've been making on, on peatland restoration. We're continuously, it may not need a blue chip or a computer chip, but these are new technologies and new practices that are completely being defined and, and or, well refined all of the time by the third sector who are out there and, and pushing best practice really and trying to develop new stuff. So this is something that's, that's really key. One of, the, one, of the, one of the important things I think that we need to reflect on as well is the technological advances that, um, that give us the opportunity to be much more effective as a community. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't take for granted things like, you know, the, the ability to create a group on WhatsApp. Um, what three words has allowed us to, for example, uh, work as a community where you might not have the ability to use GPS across the community because of the expensiveness of the, 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 the equipment, 
but with your phone and what three words, you can give the location of where your traps are for whenever we're doing the grass ball control or the, the non-native invasive species management. We have so many opportunities out there. And I think, you know, whilst we're evolving best practice and all of that good stuff, I think we also need to be reliant on the fact that we have the ability to be closer as a community to one another. And when it comes to the points that we've been making, you know, the ability to reach out to politicians, the ability to learn from one another, to, 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 to collaborate, and, um, and really to, to advocate, um, that technology allows us to, as a collective, um, be much stronger. And I think that shouldn't be something that we shy away from whatsoever. Thanks, Connor. Um, Holly or Karis, do you have um, any final comments? Uh, I do have a really quick one. In terms of peatland restoration, it's still fairly new. And we have some contractors that are really good at being very innovative with the sorts of machinery that they use to do certain techniques. Um, and, you know, we share that with the rest of sort of the industry and things. So in terms of very specific peatland restoration, then there's definitely a lot of technical, technological innovation that's happening there. Thanks, Karis. Holly? Oh, sure. Thank you. I thought uh, Connor and Kara summed it up really well. I would just add that um, maybe from our perspective in Canada with the extent of the landscape, um, you know, the geographic extent that um, drones in particular have been really, really helpful for um, wildlife research and understanding species migrations and habitats and habitat impacts. And so that has been incredibly useful for our scientists, similarly with other tools under the sea. Um, in increasing understanding and then having that beautiful footage that helps to inspire uh, change. Well, thank you all three of you um, for being a really phenomenal panel of, of Sterling alumni experts. This has meant the world to us. I think it's been such a such an interesting afternoon um, in a very short period of time because this has absolutely flown by. We have discovered uh, discussed all sorts of huge questions and massive challenges. And yeah, I think we've all come away from this feeling a little bit positive, a little bit hopeful. Um, and if nothing else, we've certainly seen some of Connor's cute mice, which has also helped matters massively. So this has been a fantastic session. Um, Jen, Alex, thank you so much for getting us through all of the questions on time. That has to be an absolute record. Um, and to our three alumni experts, Connor, Karis and Holly, a massive thank you from all of us at Sterling. Um, and we very much look forward to, to speaking with you again. Thank you to everyone for attending. We'll have